The jet age didn't arrive like a slow, polite evolution. It hit aviation like a step change, one of those moments where the rules don't bend, they snap. To get the scale of it, look at the numbers. Around 1943, a good piston fighter living on the edge of its design could run roughly 400 to 440 miles per hour. Just 10 years later, bombers were pushing about 480 miles per hour, and frontline fighters were breaking 600 miles per hour. And then the story kept going until the sound barrier stopped being a rumor and became a routine test point. But the engine wasn't the only thing that changed. Jets dragged an entire new ecosystem behind them. Longer runways, radar and fire control, sealed and later pressurized cockpits, and most of all, new aerodynamics like swept wings, just to stay alive near transonic and beyond. Piston aircraft didn't stall out because engineers ran out of ideas. They hit a hard ceiling. As power and airspeed climbed, the tips of the propeller blades began flirting with the speed of sound. Once that happened, shockwaves formed, efficiency fell off a cliff, vibration and noise skyrocketed, and mechanical stress went through the roof. The harder designers pushed, the worse everything got. The most extreme illustration came later with machines like the XF-84H Thundercreech, proof that forcing a propeller past its limits didn't unlock the future. It only made the problem louder, rougher, and more dangerous. On paper, a jet engine looks almost laughably simple. Air goes in, gets compressed, mixed with fuel, ignited, and blasted out the back as thrust. That's it. In reality, it was a technical minefield. The materials of the late 1930s barely tolerated the heat, with critical sections running well over 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. Rotors had to spin at terrifying speeds, with tolerances measured in thousandths of an inch. Engineers barely understood compressor and turbine airflow, so stalls and surges arrived without warning. And no, you couldn't just shrink an industrial gas turbine and bolt it to an airplane. Weight, durability, and packaging made that idea a fantasy. Step one, quite simply, was convincing the engine to stop exploding. By the late 1930s, two very different paths were racing toward the same destination. In Britain, Frank Whittle was an RAF officer with a radical turbojet idea. His approach leaned on a centrifugal compressor and multiple combustion chambers. Practical, robust, and brutally hard to fund. He ran headfirst into bureaucracy, scraped together backing, and eventually formed power jets, where early bench tests proved the concept worked, even if everything else fought him along the way. In Germany, Hans von Ohain came from the opposite direction. Working independently, he explored a different layout for compression and combustion, even experimenting with hydrogen because it burned cleanly and ignited easily. Crucially, he found a skilled mechanical partner who could turn theory into metal. The story isn't about who was first. It's about how two very different engineering philosophies arrived at the same revolutionary answer. There's no avoiding the patent question. At one point, German lawyers and paperwork clearly showed awareness of Whittle's turbojet patent. But the reality is less dramatic than the arguments that followed. The German team adjusted their work to avoid direct overlap, and the technical solutions diverged in meaningful ways. In the end, both Whittle and von Ohain would later describe what happened more simply. Independent ideas converging on the same breakthrough at the same moment in history. What turned von Ohain's ideas into a flying machine was Ernst Heinkel. Heinkel was a rare figure, someone who looked past procedures and saw possibilities. He was willing to spend his own money on projects no one else would touch, and he had little patience for waiting on official approval. Instead of asking permission from the air ministry, he quietly launched a private, highly secret jet program of his own. 
At the same time, his company was experimenting with radical concepts like the HE-176 rocket aircraft, a sign of just how far Heinkel was willing to push the limits, all at once and without a safety net. The Heinkel HE-178 wasn't designed to be elegant, fast, or even practical. It was designed to make one thing happen, get a jet engine into the air safely. Everything about the airframe followed that single goal. It was kept as simple and as light as possible, with no ambition beyond proving the idea worked. The wings were straight, because sweep wasn't necessary for a proof of concept. The wings and tail were built largely from wood to save weight and speed construction. The cockpit sat far forward, while a round nose intake fed air through internal ducting to the engine buried in the fuselage. Exhaust traveled down a long tailpipe, carrying heat and thrust straight out the back. On paper, the HE-178 hinted at refinements like retractable landing gear. In reality, flight testing demanded different priorities. The goal wasn't elegance or efficiency. It was getting airborne, landing safely, and fixing whatever broke next. This was a test aircraft, not a finished product, and the design wore that truth openly. The engine story behind the HE-178 was anything but smooth. Fonohain's first unit, the HES-1, ran on hydrogen, not because it was practical, but because it burned cleanly and proved the basic idea could work at all. The next step was the HES-3, redesigned to run on liquid fuel and built around a reverse flow layout. That configuration sacrificed efficiency, but it made the engine short enough to fit inside an airplane an acceptable trade when simply getting airborne was the goal. The early HES-3A version fell short. Thrust was weak, reliability was questionable, and it earned a reputation as an expensive way to heat the factory floor. The breakthrough came with the HES-3B, which pushed thrust close to 1,000 pounds, just enough to fly. With improved stages, guide vanes, and airflow control, it finally looked less like an experiment and more like a real jet engine. Before the HE-178 ever flew on its own, the jet was tested in secret beneath another aircraft, the HE-118. The timing was deliberate. Takeoffs happened before dawn, around 4 a.m., and landings were completed before the factory came to life. Secrecy mattered. In these early flights, the piston engine handled takeoff and landing, while the turbojet stayed silent until the aircraft was safely airborne. Then came ignition. A flash, a sudden rush of hot exhaust, and the unmistakable feeling of the airplane surging forward under jet power alone. It worked, briefly. And then, true to early jet development, the HES-3A burned itself out after the flight. At least, as the story goes, it had the courtesy to wait until the airplane was back on the ground. Those early tests taught pilots something entirely new. Jet thrust was smooth, no piston pulses, no heavy vibration, just a steady push with a faint, high-frequency hum from the compressor and turbine. But it was also slow to respond. Jets needed time to spool up, and throttle movement didn't translate into instant power. Pilots learned quickly that opening the throttle wasn't a command, it was a request, and the engine answered on its own schedule. The final step came quietly. On August 24, 1939, during a high-speed taxi test, the HE-178 did something unexpected. It lifted off. Just briefly, an unplanned hop into the air, but enough to prove the machine wanted to fly. Three days later, they committed. Early in the morning of August 27th, before the airfield stirred, the HE-178 lined up for history. The plan was conservative by design. A short flight, no heroics, roughly six minutes in the air, 
and two gentle circuits of the field. This wasn't about performance, it was about survival. The takeoff was clean. Once airborne, the jet settled into a strange new kind of flight. Quiet, smooth, almost unreal compared to piston aircraft. Then, near the end of the second lap, trouble arrived. The fuel pump faltered. With thrust fading, the pilot wasted no time. He side-slipped the aircraft hard, trading altitude for speed to get down quickly. Morning fog hung low, and the rising sun cut across the runway, washing out depth and contrast at the worst possible moment. Still, the landing was controlled, uneventful even. The world's first successful jet flight ended without drama, and that was the point. Back in the hangar, the mood finally changed. Someone produced champagne. Breakfast followed. Six minutes in the air had quietly rewritten aviation history. The differences showed up immediately after landing. A jet didn't sound like a piston aircraft at all. Instead of a deep, throaty roar, it produced a sharp, high-pitched whine that lingered in the air. Heat was another concern. The tailpipe ran dangerously hot, raising worries about damage to the rear fuselage. Even landing behavior changed. Without propeller drag, the rollout was long and approach speeds stayed higher. This wasn't just a new engine. It was a new kind of airplane. When the HE-178 was finally shown to the Reich Air Ministry on November 1st, 1939, the reaction was far colder than the milestone deserved. Sources differ on exactly how many flights had taken place by then, but common sense fills the gap. You don't roll an experimental aircraft out in front of senior officials without flying it a few times first. That much is obvious. The demonstration itself didn't help. On the first attempt, the engine failed to reach full thrust. On the next, the aircraft managed little more than a fast pass and a brief buzz over the field. It was enough to show that the idea worked, but not enough to inspire urgency. To the men making wartime decisions, the jet looked interesting, nothing more. Germany needed fighters and bombers it could build by the hundreds right now. And in 1939, that still meant pistons, not promises. Even so, the message landed where it mattered. While senior leadership remained cautious, the technical branches inside the air ministry understood what they had seen. The turbojet was no longer a curiosity or a laboratory trick. It worked. From that point on, jet propulsion quietly became a serious line of investment inside the system, even if it wasn't ready for the spotlight yet. Where that new funding went says a lot about how large systems make decisions. The Air Ministry preferred a clean division of labor. Airframe companies built airplanes, and specialist engine firms built engines. Junkers and BMW fit that model perfectly. Their jet programs could be supervised, standardized, and shaped from the very beginning. Heinkel's work, by contrast, had grown outside the system, fast and independent, with little institutional buy-in. There was also a technical bet being placed. Axial flow compressors, though harder to perfect, promised far better long-term performance. That future belonged to Yumo and BMW, not to Heinkel's earlier, more improvised path. Heinkel did try to claw his way back. The HE-280 was a twin-jet fighter prototype, and it flew early, well ahead of most competitors. On paper, it had real promise. But airplanes don't succeed on promise alone. The engines it needed were uncertain, production priorities lay elsewhere, and the political momentum had already shifted. The ME-262 wasn't chosen because it was perfect. It was chosen because it fit the system, its engines, its factories, and its command structure. It was the jet the entire machine could push forward. 
The HE-178 itself didn't linger in history. It flew only a handful of times before being retired and placed on display at the Berlin Air Museum, where it was destroyed during bombing raids in 1943. A refined HE-178 V2 was already under construction, with plans for a cleaner canopy, improved landing gear, and a better engine. But that work was abandoned as attention shifted to the HE-280. Its legacy, though, was decisive. The HE-178 never became a production aircraft, but it served as physical proof that jet propulsion was real, flyable, and practical. That single fact helped trigger far larger jet programs. In hindsight, history now records Germany flying a jet aircraft nearly two years before Britain's equivalent efforts reached the air. After the war, Hans von Ohain went to the United States, continuing research on turbines and advanced propulsion. He later met Frank Whittle. They became friends and quietly dismantled the myths around who copied whom. Whittle's struggle led to operational fighters. The HE-178 arrived first, opened the door, and then faded, forgotten precisely because it came too early.